This, believe it or not, is a time capsule of 2020. In the very bottom of this vial, there are images, sounds, videos, about 20 megabytes of science stories from this ridiculous year. We wanted to close the door on 2020, but we can't ever forget what happened this year. We want our descendants to see this stuff. And we decided that the best way to do that was to encode our digital mementos into DNA. Really. DNA was arguably the first data storage system on Earth. It's a workflow for all known life to read and write its own blueprints. And in the past few years, it's become practical to use that same machinery to store any data at all. In essence, to build a tiny chemical vault for the ages. So we did. Here's how. Yeah, so let's get right into it. Um, 2020. What are your thoughts? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, when I think about the past year, I had the very, very overwhelming experience, particularly in February, of spending all of my time thinking about this thing that I knew was going to sort of be a huge deal and a huge disaster. We were watching the reactions of the epidemiologists and we were seeing them get scared. My editors are taking this so seriously that they're stocking up on beans. Um, I better go buy some beans and lentils too. <laughs> and then, you know, March hits. The toll of the coronavirus widens in the US. Each new day, it was just an exponential rise of new cases. We were seeing the case numbers rise. We were seeing the shortages of PPE. There was only one gown on the floor. The hospitals were just churning through PPE. We were facing what felt like an insurmountable surge. And we had a lot of groups using things like 3D printers to make face shields and sending them to hospitals. I think there was a lot of fear and despair over just the ways we weren't responding as a country. One of the things that a crisis does is it reveals problems and fault lines and, and makes them um, impossible to ignore. We have seen that communities of color are more vulnerable. We've seen communities of color start really powerful social movements to see people fight so hard this year for themselves and for each other was hopeful. Um, we really needed that. I remember the, f the first night I was in my living room and I heard what sounded like cowbells outside. There were people that were honking their horn. Videos from all over the world. For a while it just became kind of for all of us that we were all in this together. I took videos and sent them to my mom since I couldn't go and visit her this year. Life also kept happening. Look, the DM2 mission, a lot of people point to it as kind of like this bright spot in a very dark year. The astronauts came out and their families were waiting for them and they had to give them air hugs that embodied what we had all been going through this past year. The virtual hugs, a very special moment. Fire was awful this year. The fires have scorched more than 770,000 acres. Our coworker Viren, he has a drone, so he was able to fly it over San Francisco and take these uh, amazing shots. It was like, oh sh like this looks incredible. But the reasons why this looks incredible, it's just wrong. When people started shutting themselves indoors, we temporarily saw the skies clear and the waters clear. Started to see images that were kind of leaning into the absurdity. There were dolphins back in the Venice canals. I don't know if that was real or not, but nature was just not healing this year. <laughs> and then there was this random stuff. So there's this video that I can't get out of my head, an autonomous robot that is giving this guy a nasal swab. Just so far into his head. I had lost my wallet, so I called the bank to get a new credit card. And we ask for your understanding should you hear a child or a pet in the background. How much we've learned and how far we've come based on January of 2020, I mean, it's almost as if we have the knowledge of, you know, our elders <laughs> in just one year alone. Okay, so out of all those stories, we pulled together about 20 megabytes worth of files to represent them. I remember the day that it was foggy in New York. You could smell the smoke in the air from 3,000 miles away. <laughs> Our science team Zoom call. That'll be fun for anyone to unpack. 
So how do we keep our files preserved for hundreds or even thousands of years? We can't just put them on a DVD or flash drive. Those are built to be cheap, not durable. Magnetic tape is used for archiving, and even that only lasts about 30 years tops. So instead, we looked at more experimental options. One is essentially a glass DVD. Data can be encoded into a silica plate at multiple depths with a super precise laser. That could last 1,000 plus years. But there was one other option that caught our eye, DNA. It's shockingly compact, can survive for millennia, and will never go out of style. It's the perfect medium for a time capsule, and the technology to make it is within reach. So a lot has happened in the past few weeks. COVID is surging through the country, so I'm stuck back at home again. Honestly, it's a pretty fitting turn for a video about 2020. But something else remarkable happened too. We encoded our time capsule into DNA. Well, we didn't do it. These guys did. So here's the, the test tube with the DNA that if it's in focus here. With the DNA. Yeah, um, can you, and so what's at the bottom of that vial? What can you see? <laughs> you see plastic, yeah. Luis Cese and Karen Strauss run the Molecular Systems Information Lab at the University of Washington. Karen also works for Microsoft Research. The lab is a joint venture. We got a virtual tour since we couldn't be there ourselves. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so since you have uh, a bunch of uh, test tubes. The lab's goal is to create computer systems that are part electronics and part chemistry, because electronics alone aren't cutting it. We're, we're capable of generating tons and tons of data, and that has been growing exponentially. And uh, storage devices to store the information has also been growing exponentially. However, the exponentials are diverging. DNA is one solution to that problem. It holds genetic information within four compounds called bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. That's similar to how computers use ones and zeros. And in the past few years, it's gotten a lot cheaper to create custom strands of DNA, meaning we can rebuild our own data files as DNA. Could you just talk to me a little bit about what makes using DNA so enticing as a storage method? Yeah, so uh, there's several reasons. First, uh, DNA is extremely dense compared to, uh, for example, flash, which is what you have in your thumb drive. It can be on the order of 100 million times denser. I can't comprehend how to even put numbers to that. So think of it as you can you can put what typically takes a whole data center, which uh, stores on the order of, uh, of exabytes. You can make it fit in a few sugar cubes. DNA is also resilient. It can take hundreds or even thousands of years to break down. The media is very durable, but also it's eternally relevant, right? So we're not going to phase out DNA as an information storage uh, medium because as long as there's DNA-based life on Earth, we're going to care about DNA. So explain to me how this actually works, because we gave you 20 megabytes of files. How do you turn that into DNA? So the first step in all of this is I took your archive and we ran it through an encoder. So if we have a sequence of bits, zeros and ones, uh, what we need is a mapping from those groups of bits into uh, the, the sequences of bases. And so one simple way to think about it is, you know, zero, zero becomes an A, zero, one becomes a C, one, zero becomes a G, and one, one becomes a T. This is what the encoder spit out. 1.6 million sequences of DNA, each about 150 bases long. Our files are all in there, plus some metadata. That's too much for UW to make in-house, so they roped in a third partner. Hi, I am Emily Lipus. I am the CEO and uh, one of the three co-founders of Twist Bioscience. Twist is a company that creates custom DNA to order. They developed their own method for printing DNA at high volume. So we got a list of uh, oligos. We call them oligos. They're short pieces of DNA. And uh, those were uh, printed on our silicon chip where we imprinted drops of A, C, G, and T one at a time to build the, the DNA sequence from scratch. On the silicon, there's a grid of tiny anchor points. Basically, a print head passes over and applies the correct sequence of bases, building up one of our 1.6 million strands at each point. It's a slow process, around eight minutes per base, but each silicon chip has about a million anchor points going at once. So altogether, it's, it's about 24 hours, I would say, 
to print uh, the entire file. What's more, the chemical reactions don't just create one copy of each strand. We actually print many strands of the same DNA sequence. So there's actually millions of copies uh, that are synthesized in parallel. And with that, our 20 megabytes of files became millions of redundant DNA segments. Twist packed up the sample and shipped it back to UW. It's probably hundreds of millions of copies of your, of your video here and there. Like, maybe even more, you know? The last step was to prove there's actually DNA in there. So Luis and Karen read our samples instead of writing it. They fed it into a sequencing machine that spits out A's, C's, T's, and G's as text. The result is a jumble of overlapping puzzle pieces, but their software can organize the snippets based on their overlap and check for errors too. Finally, they turned the data back into binary, and it became the exact same files we sent over. And uh, is there any particular file that you'd like to see, or should I just open a random one? I don't have one in, in particular. <laughs> Goats. <laughs> the sheep invading. <laughs> Do you have uh, one of the video files, maybe the, um, the astronauts saying goodbye to their kids? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, look at that. There it is. <laughs> that just left getting a copy of the DNA ourselves. Can we actually, can we keep a copy of that? Yeah, you got to keep this DNA. You're getting this on the mail. You know, you're gonna look like it's empty. You're gonna have to, <laughs> there is DNA here, we promise. Awesome, well, he actually terrified. You can just barely make out this little smudge of red at the bottom of the vial. It's very cool. Well, this is it. This is 2020 in a vial. Luis and Karen estimate that our data should last about 300 years at room temperature. It's dehydrated and infused with a commercial preservative called DNA stable. Keeping it away from light, heat, and moisture will help too. Karen also sent us some microscope slides showing DNA that's been encased in different protective materials. There's a kind of salt, a glue-like compound, a nitrogen-rich material, and tiny silica beads. The blue you're seeing is stained DNA. There's even this little capsule. You put DNA inside and pressurize it with inert helium gas. In here, DNA could remain readable for potentially hundreds of thousands of years. There's one last question we need to consider. What do we actually do with our time capsule? How do we keep it safe for centuries on end? Do we bury it in a mine shaft or launch it to space or turn it into a family heirloom and pass it down from generation to generation? The possibilities are endless, but here's the kicker. We could do it all. Remember, there are millions of copies of our time capsule in here. So even if we scraped off a tiny bit, it would still contain a complete data set of what we put in. That means we don't just have one time capsule, we have as many as our ambitions allow. If it were up to me, the way I would do it, I would just make tons of copies and just put it in a large number of places everywhere. Just uh, even had these crazy ideas of what if we just have it and we just like shoot it and then just like we'll cover all surfaces with DNA such that whenever we cover, like you just go get whatever, you just get a sample here and then and read it. So that would be the ultimate way of doing it. Just like make a ton of copies, just spread it all over the world. So that's how we're spending the final days of 2020, trying to figure out how to ferry these little strands of DNA through the centuries. We're trying to put 2020 behind us by sending a tiny bit of it ahead of us. And like a lot of people, we're thinking about the possibility of a fresh start. And uh, what are your thoughts on 2021? I'm looking forward to 2021. I think we'll remember 2020 as sort of the, the bad thing, but we're not done yet. I'm banking on 2021 being some kind of reset. Hopefully I'll be able to see my family this year. <laughs> there is that light at the end of the tunnel, and so we have to just, you know, think optimistically about how we're going to work our way towards that. We have learned so much. I hope that we can take that and build something better. I've learned not to make plans more than a week ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, who knows? I can't wait to talk about 2020 in that folklore kind of way where it was just this insane, traumatic time that we all went through together and we look back on it as this amazing thing that we survived and we're, we were able to get through. 
So we weren't able to talk about every single item in the time capsule, but we built an interactive website where you can view its contents in full. The link for that can be found in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us this year, and here's to a better 2021. How's that sound? <laughs>